and kind of just presenting that information. Um, none of this is like really our own ideology or anything. We just kind of want to be um, a conduit for you guys to um, hear some of this research that we've been learning. And we're also gonna be posting the authors and materials so that you can do more research or anything on your own as you would like to. Um, Obviously, you're going to hear a lot more about this, but we're mainly going to be discussing um, how mainstream feminism um, is, um, I'm sorry, are, are, is excluding a lot of different sections of feminism, including indigeneity, um, as well as other different cultural um, practices, all of that kind of stuff um, can be excluded in that mainstream feminism. Our specific focus is how indigenous feminism um, is not covered under the mainstream one, um, especially since DU um, as a university is on native ground. This university is no exception to that. Um, and with um, continual frustrations like the lack of um, change with a moniker, um, we want to bring as much focus as we possibly can um, to these ideas. Um, some stuff that we're gonna be talking about is kind of how mainstream feminism has gender over community. Um, it's an um, indigenous feminisms can be an entirely different framework and way of thinking than what fe Western feminists are familiar with and have been raised to understand. Um, indigenous feminism isn't a response to mainstream feminism. It's an entirely unique um, subsect of feminism on its own. Um, and the last thing I wanna bring focus to before we get more in depth with these ideas is that if mainstream feminism is to include indigenous people at all, um, sovereignty must be a goal for all feminists. Um, with that kind of like brief introduction to give you an idea of what we're gonna be talking about. And I do also wanna add a brief content warning. We will be talking about rape and sexual assault throughout this presentation, um, but I am gonna hand it off to Hannah to start talking more in depth. Hi everyone, um, my name is Hannah and I am going to start us off with a conversation on mainstream feminism and I just want to note I'm mostly here to critique this notion in, main, in modern feminism that we're all in this together and I feel like intersectionality is definitely a popular concept over the last couple of years um, but I think many women of color can attest to the opposite, um, indigenous women especially. Um, in the first week of this class, we learned that many indigenous women wouldn't even consider themselves feminists by this mainstream definition. Um, and I think the reason for that is mainly that mainstream and Western feminism still operates from this Western epistemology, this Western way of knowing. And so indigenous peoples and other peoples of color are not, they, they root their feminisms in their own ideologies. Um, Patricia Collins, who is a Black feminist writer, she notes that many non-white epistemologies are not even recognized as legitimate by mainstream knowledge-making processes. And so how can we even begin to truly include Indigenous feminisms or any other marginalized groups' feminisms when those feminisms aren't built for the Western woman? And so I think heteropatriarchy is, I think, one of the central, central issues to indigenous feminisms. And heteropatriarchy refers to social systems in which heterosexuality and patriarchy are perceived as normal and natural, and in which other configurations are perceived as abnormal, aberrant, and abhorrent. By heteropaternalism, we mean that the presumption that heteropatriarchal nuclear domestic arrangements in which the father is both the center and the leader or the boss, those should serve as the model for social arrangements of the state and its institutions. And so that is a quote by Miley Arvin, Eve Tuck, and Angie Morrill. And so I think what this quote represents is that while many progressive feminists are still trying to dismantle the patriarchy, they do so by working to make it more equitable. But given the intersections of racism and heteropatriarchy, those benefits more often than not apply only to white women. There's likely not a version that I can think of of mainstream feminism that can fully operate for indigenous peoples because indigenous feminisms involve the decolonization of knowledge of land and of people. And so dismantling heteropatriarchy altogether cannot be separated from decolonization efforts. And in those efforts, white women would still be giving up power. 
And indigenous feminisms are also separated from mainstream feminisms given the central role that tribal values and sovereignty play in indigenous people's lives. And many women face tensions between fighting patriarchy and fighting settler colonialism. Non-native women and queer people face an entirely different sets of struggles that where fighting for the rights of your people may complicate fighting for the rights of women within your community. For example, many, one of the, I think, tensions between mainstream feminism and indigenous feminisms is that many mainstream feminisms are characterized by trying to restructure traditional family dynamics, freedom to engage in historically male dominated spaces. So I'm thinking like women in STEM or women being CEOs of a company um, and wanting to be valued outside of motherhood, which I think is this idea that before I'm a mother, I'm a woman as well. And so these ideals of mainstream feminism employ a narrative that may not coincide with native women's histories and cultures. Many indigenous authors have documented some of these narratives. Kim Anderson writes that before the colonization of native people, motherhood was a source of power for women in both personal and private spheres. And she's critical of the modern diminutions of political power for women when that power is only seen as the birthing and teaching of entire nations. And so this may be seen as an overworking of native women, which confuses their strength with willingness to accept neglect. However, in Furness St. Dennis's exploration, many Aboriginal women held high status in society and in Navajo nation membership is matrilineal. And so these narratives represent tensions between these ideas of motherhood and womanhood in indigenous communities alone. It's not a monolith. Ideas around motherhood also inform kinship structures. In many indigenous communities, livelihoods are sustained by strong kin relations in which women had significant authority. And that's another quote from Kim Anderson. Kate Shanley writes that native women have always held a different idea of family and they may not be seeking to redefine these familiar frames the way that many Western feminists are. A function of American culture inherently is capitalism. And mainstream American feminism is to some extent inseparable from those ideas. Hanani K. Trask writes that American feminist ideology assume the essential value of individual accomplishment and ambition. So while there are certainly many American feminists who agree that capitalism and racism are, they go hand in hand, they're inseparable, and that capitalism isn't a liberating process. But anti-capitalism and by extension anti-racism are not guaranteed structures in American widestream feminism. Lee Miracle points out that this still leads to the exclusion of groups of women intentionally or not. She also knows that any time that she'd been included or displayed as a member of mainstream feminism, it was always as a prop or as a diversity token, rather than having the women who surround her concerned with the legitimate and separate issues that she tried to bring to the table. And I think while white women are concerned with stopping the objectification of women, Native women in Miracle's experience were so far dehumanized by racism that they couldn't even be objectified. And so in order for Native women to get to a point where they can tackle misogyny, anti-racist initiatives are a priority to ensure that they're at first seen as women and as people to the most basic respect. And I feel like, I understand that. I think if you are in any field of academia, you might be wondering how any of this would apply to you, especially because allyship for indigenous women is very complicated with, as we all engage in settler colonialism. But I would argue that these ideas are relevant to any field. For example, I study global development and I think one of the biggest issues within global development is that theorists will often generalize about what is good for a community clean water schools, a, a liberal market economy to lift them out of poverty. But the same issue applies here. Those ideas do not take into concern like the, the needs and the wants and desires of those people. And they are certainly not including indigenous people in those conversations as well. Whatever ways of knowing or whatever we study, whatever we're learning at an at a institution like this, there are other knowledges that exist that we have either colonized or ignored completely. And they would operate from a more holistic and community-based approach. <laughs>
And so my colleague Margot is going to get a little bit more into this notion of colonization and decolonization. Um, going off what Hannah was just saying, I'm going to open the conversation on colonization and decolonization efforts with another quote from Arvind Tuck and Morrell. Um, Everyone living in this country is not only racialized and gendered, but also has a relationship to settler colonialism. So regardless of whether or not we choose to acknowledge the relationship, it is there. Um, and Arvind Tuck and Morrell further established that settler colonialism is a structure. It is not an event preserved in the past. It is not something that no longer exists. It's not a time period to study in elementary or middle school. Um, it is a structure that is pre prevalent in our society today. It informs our law and is the backbone of our current society. Um, and another example that Hannah provided is the heteropatriarchal patriarchal structure of the hegemonic nuclear family that has been forced upon a lot of natives. Um, Arvin Tuck and Morrell further also outlined the concept of manifest destiny, which informed a lot of the pioneer mentality um, as Manifest destiny relied upon gendered and arrogant notions of the dominion of man over the earth. The, divin the divination of the founding and expansion of the United States and narratives of American exceptionalism, which are still employed to defend the country's role in global politics and occupations. Manifest destiny somewhat after the facts became the explanation for the atrocities of settler colonialism. More for those who benefited by settler colonialism so that they might more easily stomach their own complicity in ongoing colonization. Um, manifest destiny and colonization acted both as a mode for genocide, land theft, and rape. The heteropatriarchal settler colonial mentality stigmatized native bodies and native women as hypersexual, promiscuous, or easy. These ideas have had lasting effects on the treatment and the lack of protection for native women, and with most, most of the violence, rape, and assault experience acting as extensions as means of, or, or as means of colonization. Um, the importance of just jurisdiction and jurisprudence also heavily impacts Native communities in both efforts for decolonization and reflect current ongoing structures of colonization in our nation. For violent crimes and sexual assault committed on Native territory, the tribal jurisdiction is heavily restric restricted by federal legislation. Native women who choose to speak out regarding the rape or sexual assault um, must navigate their healing and justice by reporting to the very colonizers themselves. They work through a legal system built by the same people who did not even consider them to be human beings or their bodies to be their own. One that constantly challenged their individual and collective sovereignty. Um, and then a quote from the beginning and end, end of rape by Sarah Deer, the same men who brought the trauma of rape with their physical presence also represented powers that would ultimately put a stranglehold on the type of tribal authority they would recognize. Um, a few acts and a few um, legislative moves have both restricted tribal authority and given a bit more tribal authority in the US history. Um, when tribal governments are given sentencing authority as dictated by the Indian Civil Rights Act, um, which is a misnomer, uh, the original act capped tribal sentencing ability for violent crimes such as rape at six months or a $500 fine. Later amendments permitted the act to, um, permitted tribal authority to sentence for a year of incarceration or a $5,000 fine. And then the, the later Tribal Law and Order Act passed in 2010 by the Obama administration uh, now allows for a rapist to be incarcerated for three to nine years and they can be fined up to $15,000. While both of these, while the development of these acts shows a trend in an increase of tribal authority, it still undermines tribal authority by limiting sentencing ability and adheres to the mold of the prison industrial complex, assuming that tribes agree that punishment by incarceration is the most appropriate response for any crime without providing the opportunity for tribes to craft a justice system of their own. Yet another attempted fix in jurisprudence was exhibited in the Violence Against Women Act passed in 1994. Upon its passing, there was a tribal jurisdiction provision that originally would have set a precedent for more tribal jurisdiction, it was removed. The removal of the tribal jurisdiction provision was limited to a drafting error and was forgotten about immediately. Additionally, Violence Against Women Act determined that there is only one federally recognized tribe in Alaska. Out of the 229 existing tribes that still are in Alaska, um, and the 
it was attributed to the fact that there is no more Indian country in Alaska. And the federal government furthermore will not recognize tribal protective orders in Alaska. If the tribal protective order is enacted on tribal land. It will not be maintained or withheld as soon as you step off tribal land, um, which gives abusers a very clear space to take advantage of this system and gives them a sense of a lack of repercussions for any, any abuse. Um, and the final grants um, of VAWA that passed after the act had been occurred, um, it permitted more grants for hopefully um, further resourcing tribes. The grants are only really covering after the fact aid. So women are already victims when the grants take effect and they are a band-aid to a bullet hole. Um, overall, the Violence Against Women Act took a stand against violence against women, perpetuated against women, um, while making it abundantly clear which women truly deserved federal protection. Through an examination of this act, a more cohesive understanding of the importance of tribal jurisdiction and the right for tribes to have tribal jurisdiction and the recognition of tribal sovereignty, as well as the gross inadequacy of the federal legislation program regarding Native tribes and bodies is achieved. So in moving towards an efforts for decolonization, um, one author really stuck out to us. Um, she, it is um, Bree Singh Baldi, and she writes a book on, um, it's called We Are Dancing For You on Native uh, Feminisms and the Revitalization of Women's of coming, coming of Age Ceremonies. And in this book, she discusses that decolonization is not a metaphor. It must be brought into the tangible efforts. It, this is accomplished by the rewriting, rewriting and rewriting of native, native feminisms. And that is not a mistake. Um, each rewriting is a different form, um, both with rights, R-I-G-H-T, R-I-T, as in ceremonial rights, and actually rewriting a narrative. This process is established, is reestablishing their position in history. And this is done through the embodied and physical enactment of decolonization through the ceremony. Um, one other author, Lisa Cajaole, um, Art Hall argues, um, intellectual, political, artistic, and, sp and spiritual, um, and the recl reclamation of the colonized body is at the center of the work. Hall sees native feminisms as being able to articulate this method of, colon of decolonization through reconstructing tradition and memory, through the process of actually getting to have practice and reclaim their own ceremonies, effective decolonization is seen. Um, another place where effective decolonization is seen is getting your own jurisdiction and your own jurisprudence and the recognition of tribal sovereignty, which is inherent, but must be recognized by federal authority. And finally, our colleague Nadine will talk about the frameworks for discussing um, indigenous feminisms. Thank you so much, Margo. Um, I'm Nadine. I'm a first year here at DU and um, have just been completely compelled by um, all the conversations we've had throughout Indigenous feminism and the authors we've got to um, read. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, be talking about desire-centered research um, and damage-centered research, as well as this idea of survivance um, and hope, which are all kind of acts of decolonization um, and ways of connecting Indigenous feminism to um, reclaiming and re-representing um, communities, not just Indigenous communities, but communities who have been, um, as, as um, Eve Tuck puts it, dispossessed. Um, so I'm going to start with a quote in her from one of her articles called Suspending Damage. She says, I invite you to join me in re revisioning research in our communities, not only to recognize the need to document the efforts of oppression on our communities, but also to consider the long-term repercussions of thinking of ourselves as broken. So that quote right there really leads us into this idea of damage-based research, which is what, at least what I had experienced, um, the, the vast majority of the research I had read on indigenous women specifically was damage-based. It was um, making a monolith of, it was um, oversimplifying, ignoring complexity um, and reducing indigenous communities to that of simply damage, to that of simply um, just being uh, overtaken by trauma um, and kind of historicized and, and broken. And 
The issue with this form of research is um, it's mainly done at the, it can certainly be done by individuals in the community, but often it's done by, um, by people looking in, white anthropologists looking into indigenous societies um, and creating a narrative of damage that is very marketable, very profitable, very flashy. Um, it's this idea of trauma porn. It's a way of attracting the eye of uh, somebody outside the community to inside the community, but from a, a means that is just um, oversimplified and inaccurate. Yes, the um, legacy of indigeneity in the US has trauma within it, but it is not simply trauma and it is not simply damaged and it is not simply broken. And looking at indigenous communities in this way of this oversimplified kind of like broken um, uh, narrative um, is really effective in uh, historicizing uh, indigenous communities and actually in, uh, furthering settler colonialism and heteropatriarchy. Um, it really has to do with the outside white researcher often uh, looking in and creating a narrative that they uh, want to support, that they want to promote of the indigenous person. Um, often people will um, use uh, damage-based research as a way to kind of grip or to um, attract, even, and even people think it, it sets a fire underneath, um, underneath people's feet. So reading really jarring statistics about um, sexual assault within indigenous communities. Um, but what's really necessary to look at is that um, that way of thinking, that way of representing indigenous communities is completely ignoring the, the individual complexity, the unique experience attached to that statistic or whatever it may be. Um, so just to quote Tuck here, the research on our communities has historically been damage centered, portraying our neighborhoods and tribes as defeated and broken. And so perpetuating this idea that indigenous tribes and other communities are just completely broken and just damage centered, damage based, um, is really successful in allowing in in losing the voice of the actual indigenous person in the community, um, because in reality uh, there's so much more to specifically the indigenous experience than just trauma and just damage. Um, so. Uh, in this article, Tuck discusses the idea of ethical versus unethical relationships when it comes to research. And often a really unethical form of research um, that we see a lot, especially for indigenous communities is this utilization of Western ways of knowing being pushed upon indigenous ways of knowing. So that essentially means taking um, ways of knowing that are, for example, um, specific to a white anthropologist that kind of has to do with the way that um, they view the world, the way that their uh, research is oriented based on uh, very colonial kind of ideals, and then, then pushing that on indigenous people and, and examining indigenous life through um, that way of knowing that is completely different and not relevant to uh, the indigenous person. And so an example of that would be in um, Kucha Rising, Riesling Balding's book, Baldi's book about uh, called We Are Dancing For You. She references a really notable anthropologist um, named uh, Andrew Krober, who um, he uh, essentially was uh, a, like a incredibly like a well-known, very notable white anthropologist um, known for his research on Californian indigenous people. Um, but what was really notable about his research was he tried to create hierarchies within indigenous communities. He tried to um, kind of westernize and um, kind of condense um, indigenous ceremonies into a way that was uh, into a kind of research framework that was completely uh, was not relevant to those communities and was a kind of his way of knowing being forced upon indigenous people. Um, and so then in, in Baldi's book, what she does is she goes back in as a woman who actually experienced those ceremonies, actually experienced indigenous life, um, throughout those coming of age ceremonies and rewrites, as Margot was saying, rewrites, rewrites, rewrites um, the, the research. So this idea of damage-based research, um, really, it's, it's really um, uh, focused on portraying an oversimplified view of indigenous people that is centered around trauma. It's effective for historicizing, misrepresenting, um, and silencing the actual narratives of indigenous people because often they're not the ones um, portraying these stories. Um, so that's an incredibly important aspect. But then um, on the flip side of this, moving forward, 
um, looking at hope, looking at survivance. Tuck offers the idea of desired centered research as an antidote um, to this um, damage centered research. And so what desired um, research does is um, it extends a call for all of these communities to utilize their traditions, their ways of knowing, um, their individual experiences, which um, academ Western academia often doesn't value felt theory that Diane uh, Million presents. Um, this idea of valuing an experience at the center of academia and allowing an experience and, a, and felt theory to be legitimate. And so you have Krober, who is a white anthropologist talking about indigenous women, and then you have Baldi. And often, even though Krober didn't experience um, indigeneity or any of these ceremonies, he's looked at as an authority over Baldi, a woman who actually did experience these ceremonies, simply because um, Western academia doesn't value uh, felt experience um, in its its realm of what is legitimate, a legitimate form of research or academia. So going back to desired centered research, um, it really has to do with um, capturing desire rather than damage. So um, what is recognizing complexities? Desired re centered research doesn't aim to um, discount trauma. It aims to bring to light the complexity of an experience and put at the center the voice of the actual indigenous person, giving them a chance to rep like giving them uh, giving them the space to represent themselves in the way that they desire most, in the way that is most effective, and the way that is most traditionally relevant uh, relevant in ways of knowing, um, and is is um, is is desired most by them. Um, and so just moving on quickly to this idea of survivance, um, and, and sorry, just one more quote from uh, Tuck. She says, as I will explore desired, explore desired based research frameworks are concerned with understanding complexity, contradiction, and self-determination of lived lives. So that idea of like lived lives is really central to this healing that desire centered research can provide. And so lastly, really quickly, um, Tuck enters into this idea of survivance. Um, and she says, survivance is not just survival, but also resistance, not heroic or tragic, but the tease of tradition and my sense of survivance outwits dominance and victimry. Um, so it's not just about survival, it's about the, uh, the dominance of, uh, of, of moving forward with a, like a veracity of re-representing and uh, really challenging uh, the narrative that has been formulated by uh, white Western society about indigenous people. Um, and so that's, those are just some, some main ideas that correlate to desire-based versus damage-centered research. So. That is the end of our presentation. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. Um, we really just wanna emphasize that our goal here is to allow you guys to think about something that you might not have considered before the way many of us hadn't until we had taken this class. Um, and so we are looking forward to some Q and A. So there's one question on the Q&A so far. Um, isn't capitalism that afforded the modern woman to even be able to entertain their role in society, feminism, unencumbered by poverty? Um, I, I can try to take a stab at this, but you guys totally jump in anywhere. Um, I would say, yeah, sure. Capitalism has certainly allowed many people to lift themselves out of poverty. But for women, their role in society today is still one that operates within patriarchy. And whatever benefits that capitalism has afforded women applies to white women almost exclusively. Um, capitalism requires an exploited class. And so those intersections of privileges are harming women of color even more so. Um, and moreover, in terms of an indigenous context, capitalism also relies on values of productivity and exploitation that may not align with values that many indigenous communities may hold. And so yeah, while yes, like many Western women may not be living in dire levels of poverty, are they really liberated when they're still fighting for those spaces of authority and legitimacy and women of color are still being left behind? So that's, that's the way I think of it. <laughs>
Yeah, and to piggyback off of Hannah with that, it really is about looking at the system itself um, and what the system is kind of producing. So um, looking at like uh, kind of uh, capitalism as a whole, kind of like working within that system, um, it's always going to lead to like unequal outcomes, especially for women of color. And so the problem with working for equality within a system like capitalism that is so heavily centered around exploitation, because the, the whole point of capitalism is producing unequal means. And in the U.S., that often means people of color are at the um, are, are receiving far less than uh often a white, ma white majority that is receiving a lot more. And so um, when you look at the system itself, that is kind of like, there's only so far you can go within, a, within the system itself. And the reality is um, it is, it, capitalism is not a very, uh, it is not at all um, a system in which uh, equality can really ever be achieved. So um, yeah. Awesome. Um, there's, I'll just say, um, it's not really a question, but someone said, thank you for this presentation. You have done a great job. Thank you for that. <laughs> and then another question, um, could you talk a little bit more about how you see settler colonialism shaping all women's experiences, not just indigenous women? Um, and we can start with that one. And then there's going to be a second part as well. If you guys have. Um, I, I, okay, you yeah. know, you okay. Okay. Okay, I'll, yeah, you. Okay, so I'll start. Um, so th this is something um, that definitely exists um, throughout America as a whole, um, as a settler colonial state. Um, indigenous women certainly have um, the worst end of the stick um, with in, in terms of like land and all of that kind of stuff, but colonialism is something that affects us. Um, literally in everyday life, we are raised under this Western culture that was kind of like made with um, um, colonialist experiences and stuff like that. Something um, that I like to talk about specifically with it is um, as a queer woman, woman um, that is something that definitely comes up a lot is that settler colonialism has made this hetero um, patriarchal society where, you know, being straight, being um, male is like the highest like form. And so you come run into other problems with like queerness, um, all of that kind of stuff. I'm gonna let Margo jump on because I kind of lost my train of thought there. No, um, yeah, more to your point, um, settler colonialism has shaped the good amount of American society, um, the concept of manifest destiny, as I touched upon, and the right to land, the right to anything really like this Eurocentric notion of like, we deserve what we want, um, or if we want it, we should have it, um, has shaped a lot of most of American history. And in shaping American history, it has shaped the way we make our legislation. It has shaped the way we focus about um, family, as Izzy touched upon. Um, and it shaped this also notion as the settler colonialist ideology that women are subservient to men. Um, so it's important for all feminists truly to understand the impact of settler colonialism on both women and native women, especially as, but more so women in general, simply because the structure that's enforced is one that is a, there's a dominant society and it is run by men and it is run by white men. Um, and Kelly, I hope that touched upon that a little more. I can also, I just add to that really quickly. Um, as in uh, talking about women, uh, women who the, the, sorry, the effects of uh, settler colonialism and heteropatriarchy, uh, for uh, women. So I think also it's it's important to note that it's not just indigenous women, it's women of color generally. White women still um, are benef benefit from uh, from settler colonialism in a lot of ways. Absolutely, there's um, we live in a society that's misogynistic and all women um, experience that, but it is really important to note that a lot of these ideas that we've brought up today really do extend beyond indigenous women um, and to women uh, and to women of color as a whole, um, because uh, whiteness does play such a uh, such a large role um, in this in this country, especially when it comes to 
capitalism and settler colonialism. Uh, so, so it's important to note that this is something that like many of these ideas are, um, are the experiences of black women um, and uh, so many other groups of women who don't fit into the, uh, to the white majority of women who are, are often centered in the discussion of feminism. Um, it's the, it's the, and the exclusion of women of color uh, is really, really prevalent um, in, in mainstream feminism, so. And then actually going on to answer the next question really quickly that Kelly asked, just to pop in here, I'll, I'll lead with one example. Um, because of a lot of the jurisdictional issues that Margo discussed, um, one, one, I'm an environmental science major and one area that really interests me is kind of the, the uh, connection of uh, land exploitation and uh, sexual assault and sexual exploitation. And here in the US, we pretty much have government sanctioned sexual exploitation happening when uh, large uh, pipelines and um, developmental land of development projects are occurring. Um, they bring a large influx of non-native individuals. Um, and as Margaret discussed, um, there's a jurisdictional issue in which uh, non-tribal members are not held uh, jurisdictionally responsible for their actions or are not held responsible for their actions under tribal jurisdiction, um, especially if they're not if they're not in any sort of long term relationship with uh, the, the person they abuse. And so when you have these large scale projects like the key XL pipeline being built, you have a large influx of economic opportunity, you don't have uh, legal uh, or um, you don't have law enforcement that really is uh, is um, is is able to handle um, this large influx of people. And you also have jurisdictional issues in which a native woman basically has to decide whether she's going to uh, go to an outside source, um, like the police of, of the state or stay within tribal jurisdiction, which can't really do anything if her abuser was uh, a non-tribal member. So, uh, so yes, you have this large influx of, of people working on these projects, often men. Uh, it really drives up, there's, there's a demand uh, for um, sex work and for, uh, you know, uh, sex trafficking really increases with these sorts of um, projects. So that's one example of how um, sexual exploitation of women um, can, of indigenous women can really uh, be stimulated, so. Um, I would also add to this point that um, rape in particular um, is as a construct in the context of Native communities was a tool for colonization. Um, rape was a way for colonizers to dominate and to um, take control of land um, when like making contact with Native people. And so that idea as, as just a construct today has resulted in the kind of view of Native women as hypersexual um, we see this with like the depictions of Pocahontas. Um, and we have also, this has also allowed Native women to be seen as damaged, it essentializes them. Um, and I think Sarah Deer talks a lot about this um, as well. And um, Yasmin Jawani, um, I'll post her in the chat as well, but she discusses how this has kind of delegated, relegated Native women to the periphery. Um, and we saw this with um, Gabby Petito when she went missing, we had an entire national manhunt looking for this woman and yet missing and murdered indigenous women are fully left behind. And that's not to say that Gabby Petito didn't deserve all of that attention, of course she did, but we believe that native women also deserve that kind of, that kind of attention and that kind of you know, national unification. Um, and so, I just would like to add that. Absolutely, super great points. And I also realized we never actually like read that question. So for um, the context of that they were answering, um, could you discuss a little more why native women in particular are subject to sexual assault at much higher rates than other populations of women? Why is it that for other groups, sexual assault usually happens within the group, whereas for native women, it is from outside. And so, yeah, those are great answers for that. Um, the next one I'm seeing is how do you each view your roles as allies to Indigenous women and communities? I can start. Um, I think for me personally, I am very much still learning and I think all of us are still very much learning. Um, and I think it's a commitment to not only 
learning and continuing to learn and continuing to listen, but it's a commitment to prioritizing their their ideas of what they need. Um, so in historically when seeing allies, um, especially personally I'm white, um, but as a white woman, um, giving, providing my own solutions for anyone is probably not the best way to approach allyship. And so it's really listening. It's continuing to speak out. It's continuing to have conferences like this, um, continuing to challenge other notions, um, challenge systems that we don't necessarily agree with, um, challenge maybe the institution we're at, um, whatever it is. But that for me is a lot of my allyship. And just to add on to that with um, kind of what I was discussing about desired centered research earlier is really honing in on um, prioritizing the narrative of the indigenous person. And as Margo was saying, not speaking for, um, for any indigenous person, um, because my ways of knowing um, as a non-indigenous person are, are different. And um, it's important to highlight that um, I, ca I can never, um, represent an indigenous person through my ways of knowing. And so um, really like prioritizing these texts, the narratives of indigenous people, um, that's really where it lies. Um, and changing kind of like the view that uh, is so heavily pushed upon uh, Western society of what indigeneity means, because it's pretty much majority of it is either damage centered or it's really historicized and inaccurate and just portrays that kind of wild west image of indigeneity and and both of those are um, re really uh, damaging and false so I would just add that as well this goes for literally any non-native person is to continue to recognize and accept your our own relationships with settler colonialism and to just recognize that we are all benefiting from that system and that we're all operating within it and recreating it just by existing and to just to begin to understand that and um, to make sure that we are not, we're not prioritizing our own feelings in terms of, well, I didn't, I didn't colonize people, but we do, we neocolonialism today, like we're all engaging with that. Um, and so I would just say to begin to make a commitment to recognizing that. Yeah. And I'm gonna add um, one last thing, just cause it's um, kind of like that, but I really appreciate this question. Um, this was something that uh, we were kind of like struggling with and had a little bit discomfort when like put, um, putting this panel together um, since none of us are indigenous, um, but it's also something that like, um, this panel, for example, is something we kind of like knew um, might not be covered um, in the conference and that kind of stuff, but still something we really wanted to bring attention to and just kind of like that outreach, like saying like, you know, talking about it, bringing it out into the open and that kind of stuff and not um, just like brushing it under the rug um, and pretending that these kind of things aren't a reality um, for a lot of women and communities. Um, then I'm going to move on to, um, I believe the last question I see in the Q&A right now. Um, how are you all planning to use this knowledge in your future endeavors? I, um, like I said earlier, I am studying global development and like recently we've done a little bit of um, learning on how like indigeneity enact like it how it how it engages transnationally um, and I'm really trying to take on these ideas of colonizing knowledge um, and this like white saviorism like I think development theory has a lot of potential to allow um, other communities global communities global indigenous communities to empower them to sustain themselves and to and to thrive on their own as opposed to coming in and trying to install these capitalistic you know ideas of how how to be successful um, and really making sure that we that I am engaging with the desires of those communities as opposed to what I believe is best for them um, and I think that is a huge way to ensure that like this that, that we don't continue to be um, and in, I, I, I just in my personal life that that is my goal is to um, make sure that I work on listening as opposed to thinking that I know what the right answer is. I also think a, 
decolonization decolonization as a as an effort is active it's not passive it's something that you have to work towards every single day noticing areas where i mean our whole our whole uh the whole us is a colonized society for, for the most part and so actively decolonizing it every day really starts by including this type of knowledge into the work you do as like hannah was talking about and and just bringing awareness so that as you move through your life, especially as a white person, you can recognize areas in which you're overlooking or overstepping or forcing ways of knowing upon other people. And so just having this in the back of your mind at all times allows you to be actively um, trying to decolonize and and um, and recognizing your uh, your role in colonization when you when you uh, come to terms with all these ideologies we kind of brought to the forefront. Absolutely. And I'm also just going to bring up one um, thing that I kind of like started with in the introduction as well. Um, I think one of the most important things to gain from this is if you identify as a feminist, if you're involved with the feminist movement at all, um, that kind of like inclusion like has to include like sovereignty and that kind of stuff as well. That's the main thing that I got out of this as someone who does identify as a feminist, um, like decolonization um, and and like ultimately like sovereignty like that is you can't have um you know inclusive feminism without including that kind of stuff and so just kind of like broadening that horizon um and activism going off of that yeah um so we can go ahead and move on to the next question then do you consider the ways of knowing being and relating of indigenous women out of reach for other human beings are there ways we can learn from indigenous women's etymologies that may support healing from collective trauma and collective liberation and if so how would that be rooted in appreciation and um recip sorry wow that's a reciprocity rather than appropriation and continued extraction I think that's a really uh, interesting question. And that's a question that we've talked a lot about and we've uh, kind of tried to um, identify uh, the best ways to incorporate indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous epistemologies um, and, and have a clear understanding of them and honor them by not and not force Western ways of knowing on indigenous people while at the same time not appropriating. And it's really important to recognize that as if you are not an indigenous person, there is a level of you will never be able to kind of fully understand or fully um, embody this way of knowing because A, it's simply just not meant for you, and B, um, it's not something that uh, you were surrounded with, but that doesn't mean you can't. Um, have a, an understanding of it in a, a kind of like a respectful way in a way that means that it is not your identity but it is an identity that it, but it is not something you're going to ignore um and so an ideal world anthropology kind of like would focus would be able to um really highlight and bought like uh stepping into other people's cultures and being able to really understand them from the inside out but it is a really complex kind of topic that we've really struggled with. I don't know if anyone else wants to add and really answer that, but it is something we've talked about a lot. Um, yeah, and going off of what Nadine was saying, there's, in the American culture and American society, there's this concept that all knowledge should be free and easily attainable for everyone. It's a great concept, um, but it's led to this notion that everyone deserves to know what they want to know, um, or that knowledge should be given when asked. Um, and in the indigenous ways of knowing, there's just things that should not, that are not for you. Um, and there are limitations. So there should be um, in, in, re in recognizing ways of knowing and understanding them, there's also this concept that not everything will be known as an outsider. Um, not everything, knowledge is not free all of the time. Um, and it is not, it is earned or it is like given and it should be a gift. Um, but in incorporating indigenous ways of knowing, um, there is such a different um, correlation for indigenous women um, to trauma. Um, personally, one of the ways of knowing that struck with me was that um, a woman is most powerful after she has been assaulted um, for a lot of indigenous cultures. Um, so that is like the most, the time that she is most powerful, most dangerous, most of this, she's at her strongest which is very contradictory to our current society. Um, and taking, um, we're learning from that and putting it into our society or longing to put it into our society, I think 
is the way we can try and learn about collective healing um, and the healing that could be done through respecting ways of knowing and through not forcing other ways of knowing onto others. Awesome. So that is all the questions in the Q&A right now. Um, if you have any more questions, please feel free to um, add them. I guess, does anyone else have any more thoughts on that last question in the meantime? Actually, I might add um, one of the scholars that we've read, um, Patricia Collins, she's a Black feminist. Um, she talks a little bit about this and just how centering an epistemology like of a community that you like a lot of it is um decolonizing research um research in and of itself is like the main knowledge making process by which we adhere to and so like we cannot be researching and creating policy based on research that is done from um from a way of knowing that's not actually relevant um, and so if we are to learn about, if we are to study um, communities and groups of people, anthropology is very, is <laughs> very subject to this, um, then, those, then those people, those, those ways of knowing must be centered. You, we can't, we can no longer entrust anthropologists with an outside view with our, as our authority, like on that community. I feel like that is something that anthropology as a field and most fields in general um, really would need to work towards. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, And wait um, to see if anyone else has any more questions. There's a lot of really nice comments in the chat as well. I don't know if you've seen, but thank you all for, for that. Awesome. Thank you all so much, Nadine, Izzy, Hannah, and Margo. Thank you for that incredible presentation. As a final reminder, for those of you who joined us live today, you will receive an email with a link for a session evaluation. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. Please view the online schedule and register for our upcoming Her Do You sessions. Our last one is Next, at 11.30 to 12.45, how driving toward our goal is driving us into the ground. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all.